Hi, thanks guys for having me. So thanks Mike for the introduction. I just want to quickly talk a little bit about my background. So I really started in this very scientific, academic field, biochemistry, cell biology. Spent a lot of time in the lab and really what it taught me was how to design experiments, how to phrase in hypothesis, how to test it, and really make sure that you go step by step and make sure that the decisions that you make, nothing else is really um, bypassing you. So I was really um, having this little dream that one day I could uh, cure cancer and I pretty quickly realized that's probably not going to happen within a short amount of time and after it was just me, myself and my cells, I decided that I need a little faster pace and maybe there's another way how I can make the world a better place and how I can help. So I found Health International Business School which really was attractive to me because it offered me to see the world, to see um, different parts of business, to really be introduced in several of the subjects, if it was marketing, accounting, finance, whatnot. And um, it was, I, I did learn a lot and I think my biochemistry background really helped me there because in the end the logic that you use in business is the same logic that we use in the lab. I mean, you need, you need to have an hypothesis and really test and not make assumptions. Every single step needs to be validated. There needs to be data and results for every single step of the way. Um, like Mike said, I'm, my mom is from Iran. Whoops. My dad is from Germany, so I always grew up with this multicultural, crazy loud family. And um, I love to just see different places and really understand different ways of thinking. And um, Stefan had also stressed this. It, we have that one logic that we come in with, and especially as a consultant, you come and you think you know it all, but guess what, you don't. Um, that's a picture that I took in uh, Vietnam in the Sapa Mountains. That was a, a big moment, not just for me emotionally, because I stayed with, uh, with a local family there, and I mean, they, they have nothing, and they give you everything. I mean, it, it was incredible. They cooked this beautiful dinner for us where that chicken that before you saw running around then all of a sudden ended up on your plate. That was very interesting. I consider turning vegetarian, but um, the burgers in New York are too good. And um, what I really, what was really crazy to see for me there was that I always thought education is the solution. What we need is schools that are well equipped and that are free and that will change the world. And well, the Vietnamese government thought the same thing. They built schools that are amazingly equipped. I visited one and they are for free. And guess what? Kids don't go. And they don't go because their parents don't go. Their parents go and work on the fields and they would rather like to go there as well. Their parents don't think school is important. They don't encourage going there. And well, they can't help either because some of them don't read or write. So the solution clearly wasn't just, okay, let's build some schools, let's make them for free. So that was a very big learning for me and very important for my work as an innovation consultant because we think there's this logic, it just makes sense, there's a school so people will learn. But there's a lot more to consider and that's why I think it's so important to really travel, see the world and go out there and talk to them. So I wanted to somehow find a way how I could use my background and the learnings that I have to make the world a better place, make people happier, and um, thought, okay, so what skill do I have? What's my passion? Because when you come back to what Mike had said before, I mean, you need to, you need to be passionate about it, otherwise you can't succeed. So I just naturally love to jump around with post-its and come up with crazy ideas. Maybe it's because I watch too many Disney movies, I don't know. But I was thinking who would pay me for this? Is there anyone in the world who would actually pay me for this? And if you, if you look at companies that are innovative, so if you would consider investing, would you rather want to invest in Apple or Dell? Well, innovative companies are the ones to invest in. If you want to buy a brand, would you rather buy a razor from the $1 Shave Club or the lame razor you can get at Walgreens? Well, innovative companies are the brand to buy. As, as a partner, when, when you are a startup, especially this is interesting, what, what is your exit strategy? Who's, who do you want to be bought to later on? Who's the partner that you would go to? Is it an innovative company or is it that big giant that, well, is doing it the way they always did? And then as an employee, would you rather want to work for Google or work for, I don't know, Deutsche Bahn? Um, 
So of course, if if there's if there's a culture that encourages innovation, that encourages entrepreneurship, failing early, failing often, it's it's the it's the brand, it's the company to work for. So I really think that there is a need for innovation, there is a need for design thinking, and companies understand that too. So I thought, well, maybe there's someone that would actually pay me for this. And luckily enough, just right after I graduated, I came across a company which is called Natura. And you guys probably haven't heard about Natura because we're for now solely focusing on Latin America, but we are a, one of the biggest cosmetics companies, like Mike had said, we have uh, revenues of four billion dollars a year, and Natura is known for being very innovative because we have an amazing R and D team, and we roll out new products every three weeks, and it's crazy. But on the other hand, we're also for now just having one channel, which is direct selling. So you probably know Avon, America, that those are our biggest competitors. So this is the way our business works. And Natura understands that, well, it's 2014 and uh, we have Twitter and Amazon partnering up where you just would, with a hashtag Amazon card, get things just of your newsfeed. So there is something that we have to do. So they opened up this little tiny office in Soho. So I feel very connected to the startup world because we are kind of a startup. I mean, we're five people where we have 4,000 people in Brazil. But I mean, we're lucky enough to have the big mother company give the money. And um, well, basically, they gave us a challenge saying, well, because Natura is very much about natural beauty, about being yourself, about empowerment. And the concept of makeup is a little more like, let's conceal, let's put on a mask, let's be someone else. So there's this misfit a little ethically, and that's why makeup isn't our biggest strength. So they kind of gave me this mandate of just, let's do something about makeup. And um, well, I personally didn't have a big idea about makeup. I don't use a lot of makeup. So um, I was like, well, what do we do? Let's take out the post-its. And um, I really want to come back to the design thinking process that I then use, because it's important to Mike had also stressed that not do what the company needs, what, what did Natura need. Of course, we wanted to sell more, we want to have high margins, we want to have an efficient supply chain, but that's not what the user needs. What does the user need? What does a loser like me need who doesn't even know what a bronzer is? So I, I really wanted to try to first of all understand what girls even want from it, and also what what girls that don't use makeup, why do they not use it or why do they not even consider it and why are they not willing to spend $60 on a Dior makeup? So I really went out to observe, so I spent hours and hours in Sephora and made very good friends <laughs> with the sales girls there because I asked thousands of questions and I, I was really trying to see what do people ask when they're there, what are the products that they take in their hand, what do they want to try out and um, in Brazil as well, they, they ran focus groups to really talk to girls. What is it that they do? What's your daily routine? How much time do you spend in the morning? Where do you keep the stuff in your house? So to really get like this holistic view about everything, every touch point, everything that anyone would ever have to do with makeup. And then to really define what is the problem that we want to solve. So what is that new initiative brand, product, whatever it will be that we come up with, what is that really going to do? And really create a point of view. And here the persona comes in, which I think is very, very important. It's not just, so our target group is females from 18 years old to 45 years old. I mean, that does not mean anything. So, so when, when I look at a persona, I think I have a picture here. So when I create a persona, it's really, I really come up with a random name, like a first name and the last name that really represents what that person is. How old is that person? That's not a range. That is, she's 18 or she's 22 or 62. And what nationality and what status? Does she have a boyfriend that she wants to look pretty for? Or is she single and wants to, you know? And um, what's her job? What's her income? What's the disposable income that she would have to spend on this? And then what, what are favorite brands? Is she more this like Starbucks, Apple person? Or who knows what, what she would like? And what, what's her next purchase? So if she's a student and has a tight budget, what is she willing to spend money on? And um, after we, we created these personas, we really then go to the ideation phase, where we really 
come up with lots and lots and lots of ideas, and that can be crazy stuff, like I had an idea of a magic mirror, because you all remember Snow White, right? And I mean, just lots and lots of ideas, and there it's really important that um, part of the rules of design thinking to defer judgment, and quantity goes over quality at this stage. You just pump it all out, one sticky note per idea. And um, can I have a picture here? It's like, I mean, we, it, it kind of looks like a kindergarten after all. Like you have all of these uh, materials that you use to like, prototype it, and that can be, I mean, it can be a piece of paper with who knows what on it. And um, you can also, you can see here our personas, Danielle, 28, whatnot. And um, what, what this really led us to understand is that the real challenge was that makeup is overwhelming and time consuming. Girls don't know where to start. There are all these stores, there are all these brands, there are all these products. And let's face it, I don't want to wake up an hour early in the morning. So what we wanted to create is a solution that would allow people to explore makeup, to share it, because in the end, we share everything on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, knows what. That should be something to also talk about, because what I learned in the stores is that the girls really care about referrals from their friends or their mother or whatever. Always says, oh, my mom used to use this when I was younger. I want this. So we really wanted to create a community around it. And um, we wanted to give them a, a space where it's kind of, it's an unpressurized environment. There's no stupid question that you can ask. So the solution we came up with is actually an app. So um, when, we, when we thought about this, we thought of there, there, needs to, there needs to be a way for people to learn through the app. There needs to be a hook why people would want to use this every day. And then there needs to be a continuous education in this. Because, I mean, in the end, we want to sell, right? I mean, in the end, we do still want people to use our product. So it's not that just we want to teach them how to use it, and then they go off and buy someone else's stuff, or they just buy a little bit. We want them to become pros at it and we want them to buy our things right away. So, um, so when, when Mike talked about understanding the user, he was talking about the extremes. So for me, the two extremes here really were the beginners, like me, that had no freaking idea. So for those, it would really be a training tool. It's really makeup 101, let's do this. Today, we're doing this challenge. Next week, you're doing that. And then really the experienced girl, like I don't know if you guys have heard about Michelle Fenn, but she's a huge blogger in the US who has, I mean, it's insane. She has 85 million views for one Halloween makeup video. I mean, that's more than the population of my country. I mean, it's, it's insane. So there is this whole pro field, and, and girls like to watch it because it's authentic. It's not a sales pitch. And those are the kind of people that we want to have on our platform. Because it's different from, to see that girl, just like you, to say, oh, I use this because it's so good, than just, so not sure as makeup artist recommends to do whatever. So I really thought it's important to get both these extremes in because when you have those extremes, you also get everything that's in the middle. So um, we're, we're, um, the, the, the app has been approved um, by our board of directors and we're now working to really get it to launch early next year. But I just want to um, talk a little bit about why I think this is so important for us. They gave me the challenge of let's make our makeup better, right? And I didn't come up with this lipstick that smells like strawberry, but with, with this, because I think this, especially for us, because we're coming from direct selling, is such a huge opportunity, because with this, you will see at what point of time people look at it during the day, how long do they browse before they buy something, what are the products that they like, what are the pictures that they like, what kind of makeup do they like. I mean, the data that we can get out of this is huge. It's, and especially for us right now, we have no real point of interaction with our end user. What we have now is we have our, we call them consultants, which are the sales reps that go to your house to sell. So we send them a magazine they go around, see what the girls want, order it. But with this, we can really be in touch with the end user. We can learn from them. I mean, the open innovation that we can get out of this is amazing. I mean, we would just have to ask, what, what color would you like to see next season, or what, whatever. I mean, this, the, the data for us is huge. And then 
a thing that we want to enable is literally a one-click store. So even faster than the hashtag Amazon cart, because what we will do is when you see a picture, usually when you upload something on Facebook, right, you see the tag of the friend that is tagged in this picture. Now you see which product it is, and with one tap, you're buying it. Because you save your credit card information, you save your address, everything is saved, so literally with one click, you're buying it. And that, for us, is a huge advancement from what we were before, because before we just used to do direct selling, and now we're the mobile commerce that literally is a one-click store. So, so I, I, I wanted to share this, um, this project with you because I think it's, I mean, when, when you usually go into a cosmetics industry and they give you this task of let's increase sales for makeup, I mean, you naturally, I guess, wouldn't think of something like this. And I mean, I didn't think about this the first time they told me about this project either, but this really came from this early going out to stores, talking to girls, really understanding the user and creating a persona. And I think what's important about the persona as well is not only focus on the users that you have right now, so it's not just who's buying our stuff right now, but also focus on the people that you want to sell to. So who is it that you want to buy, uh, that you want to, uh, to ha see using Natura products and design a solution for them? So I think that's why the market research that's going on right now is, I think, not very productive in that way because they always try to see, so who do you sell to? Who's using your products? What do they think about your product? But think about who you want to get this to. So um, that was my little example of Natura. And uh, I also now um, joined a startup, which is called Never Liked It Anyway. And um, it's about buying, selling, and telling all things X. So it's, um, I think our, our mission really is to make people feel better faster. So it's, it's not a platform where you can just like talk about, oh, he was such an asshole, he did this, he did that. No, it's about you moving on faster, about saying, you know what, I never liked it anyway, I'm gonna get rid of all of this, I'm gonna start a whole new life, basically. Because we, we think that there is, there's a real power of cleaning out physical stuff, also cleans out emotionally, right? Just like getting rid of all these like pictures and all of the stuff that is lying around in your room re really gives room to new things. And um, we really stress with this as well that it's, it's even, I, I mean, even if you didn't just go through a breakup, I think this is an important platform for you because in the end, feeling better faster is just, we want you to be at your best self. And this helps you get there. If that means selling something, but in the end, the whole marketplace is just, it's just a side thing. I mean, it's very much, you could also sell this on Amazon or eBay, right? But why should you sell it and never liked it anyway? Because there, you get to share the story with other girls, you get them to comment on it, you get to tell why do I sell it? Like, what am I gonna use the extra cash for? Now you can't just say, okay, it's sitting around, I just wanna get rid of it. You have to say, you know, I have this goal, I wanna take that graphic design class or whatever. So you have to say, what do you want this extra cash for? So that really, I mean, it just it motivates you, it gets you up there, right? And um, so the work that we're doing is when here, when we create a persona, it's a little different from, from Natura. It's not just about how old is she, what does she like? It's also at what emotional state of mind is she, right? Like what, what's the, we call it the breakup phase. So we, we have this sixth phase, right, where you just went silent or you're already like, super happy what breakup never happened, or you're just going out with the girls a bunch, drinking, or you're super down, just watching, I don't know, the notebook over and over again, or you're at this crazy, who knows, stage, like any day, you could either jump in front of the train or run the world, it's, it's who knows, or you're just super pissed off, you're just super angry, it's just, you cannot believe that happened to you. And um, what we really think is that if you're in these different stages of mine, there are different, um, there are different things you would want from the website. There are different products that you would buy, there's different content that you would want, and there, there's, there's a different tone that we should be using. And um, so for now, like I said, it's a, it's a marketplace, it's girls selling and girls buying, but we really wanna take the startup to the next level, which would really be having brand-owned products. So what I'm doing with the founder right now is thinking about ideas, what could Never Liked It Anyway provide that people would want. So right now we're working on an idea which is the bounce back box. 
So when, I mean, for me, it was when I was, what, like 16 in high school and super crushed because the love of my life just like, it just didn't work, right? My parents would have absolutely no idea what to do. Like, what do they do? They buy ice cream or chocolate or a random movie. I mean, they don't know what to do. So, or, or your best friend or what, whatever, right? So we think the, the bounce back box, for example, could be something that they could purchase which will get you out of this. And that could include, I mean, that could include different things where we're brainstorming what that could be, right? It could be, it could be beauty products because you want to feel pretty again. Or it could be um, fitness products because you finally want to lose those five pounds, right? Or it's, it could be something educational, like you've always wanted to do it. Or it could be travel, you've always wanted to go, but actually that boyfriend dragged you down. Right, so, so we think that this is the bounce back box, for example, is an idea of how the brand itself could sell something, which of course also if you think about we also want to make money, we can of course take 100% instead of just those 5% that, that we usually take. Um, or another thing that we're thinking about is, for example, um, the bounce back guide, which, was, which would be, let's say, in New York, what are the bars you should be going to? What are the spots you should be going to? I mean, what are the things that will get you back on track? And for us, um, for the startup, I think this is a big opportunity to think about monetizing. Because if they have, let's say, this bounce back guy, I mean, there's huge amounts of advertising that we can get out of this. I mean, if, if the audience is big enough, I mean, you can get big brands to try to co-brand it with you. I mean, it could be the bounce back box by Victoria's Secret or the bounce back box by Benefit Cosmetics or by Natura, who knows, right? So, so this is as well, I think, a good example of how design thinking can help a startup get to the next level. I mean, they're up and running, it's all working, they're a great market place, but to really take it to a next level, design thinking really helps. Understanding what do the users need, what do they want, what could we do for them to make them feel better faster. Um, so for, let's say, the bounce back box, for example, this was a mood board that I created. Like, I mean, it was just a bunch of pretty things that just all of a sudden, I mean, you see this, it's just vibrant colors and you just you already feel better. So what can be in this box that would give you this feeling, that would get you to the state of mind? I mean, maybe it really is that little person there, probably not that Gucci jacket that she's wearing because it's crazy expensive, but maybe something that will get you in shape to look that way, right? Um, so that was my little startup example, and um, well, what, why do I think that for you design thinking is important, and what, why, what do I think is important to know about it, apart from just the process? Because of course the process is like the guys mentioned, it's easy to learn, but um, I think what's important to stress is to stop ideating. It's not, the point is not, let's come up with thousands and thousands and thousands of ideas. I mean, all these companies spend so much money in getting these creative people in to run workshops and in the end having thousand, uh, thousand ideas gives you zero dollars. I mean, unless you take one idea and make it happen, it's nothing. So of course you need to come up with a lot of ideas, but I think what's stressed too much is this whole let's, let's ideate. Yeah, you need to ideate, but then you also need to do something about it. You need to take one idea and make it happen, otherwise it was just a waste of money and time. I mean, you might have had fun, but, you know. And another thing that I think is very important for, a, for a startup and in design thinking is you got to be courageous. If you believe that this thing is something, then you just got to run with it. I mean, when uh, we had another project in Natura which was about a hair device, we wanted to redesign how girls straighten their hair. And I mean, I'm sure all you girls know that this is like stupid annoying thing that you cannot even like properly use. And with my hair, it takes two hours, so I never use it. I mean, I don't care what crazy ions are in it and what pretty color it has. So I had this r probably ridiculous idea, but I thought, what about having a glove? I just like put through my hair, my hair is straight. I mean, yeah, it's crazy. I don't know what technology to use it, but one of my colleagues said to me, Lida, you know, to be pretty, I mean, no pain, no gain. I was like, well, why does it have to be this way? Whoever made that rule? I mean, if that girl can be pretty with no pain, well, why wouldn't she buy it, right? So if you believe an idea is good, no matter how crazy it is, be courageous and stand for it. You will find a way to make this happen. I mean, Steve Jobs created a thing with one button. I mean, how insane is that, right? So be courageous, stand up, and of course, I'm not saying just like fight your bosses and say no, but this is the right thing. Of course, you gotta listen, you gotta go to the market, get feedback, iterate,
but understand what's the one thing, what's the essence about this idea that cannot be changed. For example, when we, when we started with the app, I mean, I thought like all of these thousands of features have to be in it and then it will just be amazing. And the designers came to me and they said, what is the one screen that really symbolizes what that is? So you really have to take it down. What is that one screen? What is the essence of it? And on that, don't discuss with your bosses. Yeah, they've been around and they know how things work. But if that is the essence of the idea, it cannot, it cannot be changed because then you change and then another change and another change and in the end it's just another line extension. That's not what innovation is. So really be courageous. Uh, innovation just is about crazy things. And I also think stay childish. I mean, yeah, every morning when I go to work, I run the risk of being that little naive Disney princess, but I think it's important to keep that attitude to just, because as a child, you don't think this is stupid to say. You don't think this is impossible. You don't think, what are they going to think about me if I say this? Like, you got to keep that spirit alive in design thinking, because if we're just going to do it the way we've always done it, well, then, you know, we might as well just go home. Um, and I think, I mean, in the end, I'm German. I would like uh, everything to be perfect, and I make Excel sheets for everything. But <laughs> in the end, in design thinking innovation, you, you got to forget perfection. You will never figure it all out. You have to just go and try it and just see what happens. I mean, of course, I'm not saying go to the market with super immature things, but that's what Lean Startup is all about. Just go out and try it. You will never, it will never be perfect. Go try it, learn. Okay, guys, that's, that's all for me. I'm just because I think innovation is a very high, complex word that doesn't mean very much. Um, for me personally, I started this blog because I think um, I just wanted to try to show what I think are things that are innovative. Because innovation doesn't always mean I have to come up with a crazy new technology. It can be very simple things. Like today, for example, we were reading about a new supermarket concept, which is basically having no packaging. It's, it's literally just showing the product the way it is. You come with your little container, you only take what you need and you go home. And I think that is crazy innovative because first of all, we're gonna save all the waste that is um, uh, created from packaging. We're gonna save all the food that we usually don't waste because we bought this, we, we bought this two for one because we want to save money and then we don't eat it. Um, so, so that's why I try to show a little of um, what I think is innovative. I'd love for you guys to check it out and tell me what you think. And we'd love to answer any questions, right? No, not yet. Not yet. Sorry. Up, up, thank you. Okay, thank you guys. Thank you.